Good afternoon. We are in our afternoon session of our regular commission meeting of April 6, 2021. We will start with uh, no items uh, to be pulled from consent, so we're moving forward from that. We're going to go to citizens' comments on future agenda items, and we have 30 minutes uh, to cover that. So um, I'm trying to say uh, Glenn Jubilina. And then uh, Andra Griffin. Well, just keep it clean and you'll be fine. For the record, uh, Glenn Jablina, of course, uh, you know, affordable housing is my thing. So I want to talk about, I see Denise was up here before, about livable manatee. So those, are, as you know, are the funds that, that uh, support down payment assistance and helping homeowners keep their houses in shape. Well, they're broke. There's no money left. So one of the ways that I think this commission should be moving the needle to more positive direction is to use Senate Bill 7103, which allows the board to reduce or waive impact fees. And I'm sure um, Dr. Hopes can attest to me that uh, the school impact fees are out of whack for affordable housing. They're at $6,247 per house, regardless of square footage. So that has got to stop. At least the county has a sliding scale, which I hope the school board would adopt. Okay. We, you know, we don't control that. Right, Stop I know, but I'm just doing a comparison. Okay. So, saying, Glenn. so, all right, so for your impact fees, all right, you're allowed to waive the impact fees for affordable housing. This would do two things. If you use the Senate bill. We're not. If you use the Senate bill, the funds that we're now robbing out of livable manatee to pay the impact fees would stay in livable manatee, and they would have more funds for down payment assistance. So I'll give you an example. If you had five houses and the impact fees were uh, $20,000, livable manatee would pay the county impact fees because we don't, have, we don't have the vision to waive those fees for affordable housing yet. So if we're not going to do that, then at least use the Senate bill that allows you to do that. And those funds would stay in livable manatee, and they wouldn't be broke all the time. We've got a house sitting in Samoset right now, was promised uh, down payment assistance. You're out of money. And the Economic Development Board has not come back to you guys and said, we're out of money, we got projects on the horizon, give us some money. I mean, this is not rocket scientist. It is getting so far out of whack. Lumber prices are up almost 300%. Trying to do affordable housing is difficult as it is right now. And if you could waive the impact fees or set them aside, that would certainly help the, the small, uh, the small uh, developers. And lastly, I want to say on surplus property, I think you need to open that up to for-profit developers. Currently, you only have one nonprofit that's doing it. And I think uh, with the surplus property that you have coming on board, that, that would be a huge plus. I have an item. If you want me to go back, I'll come back. Um, well, you only you only get three minutes right now. Now, you right. do come back on um, consent when we get there. Right, okay. Because I have a card on you for that. Okay. Um, Andra Griffin. Andra Griffin, Manatee County. So um, my future agenda items are to discuss the role of government. Um, that votes matter and that there's consequences to each vote as we are experiencing in Piney Point. So um, the typical role of government, the primary role of government is, is primarily uh, resident safety. The next um, item would be roads and then it goes down from there. So I'd really like, um, I know we've had um, quite a few work sessions this year um, and I would really like to see some more Infra re what I consider infrastructure items. I know people are alluding that parks and recreations are part of our infrastructure, and maybe they are to a, an extent. 
But the infrastructure items I'm speaking of are roads, sidewalks, water, um, other items in this, in this county that need to be taken care of prior to parks and recreations. Um, I'm also a little concerned that last week during one of our work sessions, um, we discussed um, how our impact fees are broken down and it was a little alarming that the majority of our impact fees are going to parks and recreations um, from the infrastructure. So I would really like just to have some modifications to that where we're focusing more on the roads, water, sidewalks, and the things that are being utilized by all residents here versus um, uh, the items that are not. And with that, I'm gonna close. Thank you so much for all your help and hard work. Thank you, Andrea. Is there anyone else that would like to come up and speak on future agenda items? Seth, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. 118 is our first caller. 118, please press star six. Hi, caller. Please state your name for the record. Sure. Good afternoon, commissioners. Proudly, for the record, Christina Skepton. It's no mystery how I feel about Vanessa Ball's continued role as the chairperson of this board. But I'm a reasonable adult. I recognize that this week's meeting might not be the time to continue to encourage commissioners to do the right thing and replace her. I am sensitive to the fact that we have yet another, though not unexpected, crisis on our hands. Most assuredly, my heart goes out to all of those who were evacuated from their homes and who I am sure are worried sick about the fate of their community. It's awful. And because of this, I had actually decided not to speak today about Vanessa Ball. And then, then I see that Commissioner Ball had the audacity to post on her Facebook page that this Sunday's 60 minute piece on Florida's vaccine rollout was fake news. Don't get me wrong, I'm not here to comment on that news piece. I'm calling today because the very person responsible for vaccine gate, the very person who made us national news, nay, international news, the very person who gave access to extra vaccines to herself, friends and constituents from only two zip codes in her district, the very person who said she would do it again, the very person who withheld information about the extra vaccines from the other commissioners, the very person who did not follow the vaccine distribution lottery she voted for, the very person who was seen in this news segment standing behind the governor as he threatened to take away vaccines from us because of her actions, this very person has the gall to comment at all, let alone call it fake news. She and she alone created the elitist vaccine pop-up disgrace in Lakewood Ranch. Commissioners, she knows no shame. Any adult with a modicum of humility would have let that news segment slip quietly into the night. A remorseful adult would have slunk away praying that she could stay out of the limelight for this one. But no, she calls it fake news. She brought the attention to herself, so all bets are off. I cannot stay quiet. Vanessa Ball continues to demonstrate a complete inability to accept responsibility for her actions. Vanessa Ball continues to demonstrate a complete lack of respect for our county and residents. This is not a leader. This is not the person who will serve to unite the board and head us in the right direction. Don't trust her. She already showed you that she doesn't care about you or your constituents. She already made some of you look like fools having to backpedal against your accountability campaign promise. Don't trust her. Remove Vanessa Ball as chairperson. Next is 085. 085, please press star six. Christina, I had wondered where you were today. 085, star six, please. And that's all the calls we have, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I do want to respond <clears throat> to Glenn on, on a couple of things. He had some good points. Um, on affordable housing, I tried two years ago to um, get the state law to state that we did not have to pay impact fees because the way we do it now, and you probably know this, we actually pay the impact fee, uh, the county does, uh, for affordable housing. And so I thought it would be great if we could just go away from it altogether. Uh, but we went up to FAC, I, I, I 
got up and spoke in front of the 67 uh, counties that were present, and they did not want any part of it. So it's not been changed. We still pay uh, the impact fee the county does for affordable housing, but it is something that we have to do by state statute. That's the bad part. Um, also, uh, <laughs> on the call regarding what I wrote about fake news, that was in reference to Publix. Uh, that's what the article was about. It was about Publix. So, um, you know, I, I, that's all I can say on that. It was in reference to Publix. Uh, moving forward, um, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment on um, future agenda items. Uh, Commissioner Whitmore, you were not here when I asked, I don't think. Is there any consent items you want pulled from the agenda? No, Madam Chair, was it announced that we were supposed to be back at 1? I was up in my office, and they said, why are you here? Okay. Yeah. My thing said. It, it was said. Oh, well, I didn't. I left. So That's okay. I mean, we would have called me. Okay, I'm sorry um, I'm late. I'm never late. Consent agenda items only, citizen comments. I have one card. We'll go ahead and open on that. Consent agenda, so you, you're aware is items 18 through 41 and 48. Uh, Glenn Jubilina, you'll have three minutes, sir. Item 39. For the record, Glenn Jubilina, item 39. There is so much wrong with this. So my first concern is, um, let's look at the facts. Uh, this item should be pulled for uh, until uh, all the facts can be investigated. So the school system has a waiver fee that if you can go to the school board and justify that there will be no impact, uh, they'll waive the uh, $100,000, uh, $100, 16 homes, okay? My question to this board, has Habitat for Humanity approached the school board to get that waiver? That's the first thing. Because that 100000 can now go back into Livable Manatee and maybe provide for down payment uh, assistance programs. So I think the, 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 the redevelopment section of the government here needs to ask these questions when they're asking for $100,000. This property happens to be in the Samoset area. Their schools are not to capacity. The roads are already there. Impact fees are for new construction. So I don't want my money being spent if it doesn't need to be spent. So I think the redevelopment board needs to ask these questions to Habitat and say, show us a letter where they denied you or they approved you. The second thing <coughs> I want to say is that uh, the county impact fees, again, they get, they get paid. They should be waived or reduced. Again, there's another $83,000. Which item are you referring to now? This 39? Right you still on item 39? Yeah, okay. county impact fees. All right, okay. thank you. It's a, it's a $5,200. $83,312 would stay in livable manatee if we had an affordable housing uh, policy that waived impact fees for affordable housing. It's never going to get built this way. And funds will never stay in livable manatee if we keep pouring out to, to rob Peter to pay Paul. I say leave the money with Peter. This is, this is an insane way to do things. So right now, we are, we are robbing livable manatee out of $262,000, when in reality, we should be only paying $147,000. So the way that, that this is working out is destructive to affordable housing. I think the school board would have waived the fees for Samoset for this 16 houses. I'm just asking for accountability from Habitat, whether they've done their homework, and the redevelopment board to ask the questions. Don't come to us until you either have an approval or a denial from the school board, because it's our money paying the school board $6,200. Thank you. Any other comments? Seth, nothing? All right, we're going to go ahead and close comments on consent agenda. What is the pleasure of the board on consent? Make a motion to approve the consent agenda, Madam Chair. Second. 
All right, we have a motion to approve the consent agenda uh, by Commissioner Van Ostenbridge with a second by Commissioner Whitmore. All in favor say aye. 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 Just heard you. Thank you, Commissioner Servia. Um, all nay or any nay? No, nope. it is approved unanimously. Unanimously, Madam Clerk. I'm getting so I can't even talk now. All right, moving right along. Advisory board appointments, redevelopment and economic opportunity. Who is going to handle that? There you are, Jerry. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Jerry Lopez, uh, Director of Redevelopment and Economic Opportunity. This is the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. Um, we have several seats um, that are vacant. You have um, in front of you uh, the applications for the various seats as well as um, a list of those that qualify for each of those segments. Um, so uh, usually I believe you kind of go through seat by seat to decide um, what that appointment is and uh, we'll be here to answer any questions that you may have. All right, uh, commissioners, the first one that we'll do is seat two. Well, there's only the first two only have one person. So I'll make a motion to appoint Davina Westerfield Marucha to seat two. Second. Mm -hmm. All right, do we have to close nominations on that? Motion to close nominations. Second. Thank you. All right, we have one applicant, Davina Westerfield. Rucha. Boy. Rucha. 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 Um, I need to open to public comment. Anyone? No, I no, don't on this, do I? No, I do not. Okay. So all in favor of the applicant, say aye. Aye. All opposed? All right, it is approved unanimously, Madam Clerk. All right, the next seat, seat four. I'll make a motion to appoint Kenneth Ellis to seat four. Second. Motion, motion to close nominations. Second. Second. All right. So we'll go ahead then. We have one applicant, Kenneth Ellis, to seat four. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. Madam Clerk, it's approved unanimously. Seat seven. I'll make a motion to uh, nominate Garen Hoover. I'd like to nominate Peter DeAngelis, De please. Wrong seat. Wrong seat, honey. We're talking about seat oh. seven. Excuse me. Second. Motion to close up uh, nominations. All right, we have a motion to close nominations. Second. <coughs> with a second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all in favor then of Garen Hoover for seat seven. Say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. All right, Mr. Hoover is uh, approved uh, unanimously, Madam Clerk. Seat nine. Misty. Commissioner um, Serbia. I Yes, uh, Peter DeAngelis, De please. I'd like to nominate. Second. I'll second. I'd like to nominate Stacy Maloney. All right. Second. Um, anyone else? I guess not. Uh, Commissioner Satcher, anything? No. All right, so we have two nominees, Peter DeAngelis and Stacy Maloney. All in favor of Peter DeAngelis, say aye, please. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Well, we don't need don't to do that. that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, okay, so on Stacy Maloney, say aye. 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 All right, I believe that is a four to three vote. She needs to be more she clear. She needs to know who they are. Can you raise your hands if you voted for Stacy, please? Four. All right, so it is Commissioner Satcher, Commissioner Ball, Commissioner Cruz, and Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. So Stacy Maloney um, receives the nomination. That's it for that. All right. So, and then we have a motion for adoption of resolution R21-022. I'm not on that yet. So moved. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion to approve by Commissioner Whitmore, second by Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, it's approved unanimously. Thank you. Jerry, easy. Uh, Madam Chair, just the um, just making sure for the first one was um, we did have one um, seat four that we did need to terminate um, and your authorization to sign. Just wanted to make sure. I'm sorry. That say that again. I couldn't hear you. It was the first item. So um, authorization to terminate um, the board member who held seat four right. and execute the termination letter. Um, I'll, I'll make that motion. I didn't even see he that. He hasn't attended any meetings. Where is that? It's on your agenda. 
It's first, the first part. He hadn't attended met the requirements. It's, it's a little bit confusing. We'll correct yes, that. Yes, it in is future. confusing. It's fine. We'll Thank correct you. it in the future. Yeah. Brad, uh, the attorney said he didn't even see that. <clears throat> see it. So we need authorization to terminate affordable housing advisor advisory Mr. committee member Bode. who holds seat for and, and do a uh, execution of termination letter. Do we have the termination letter? I've not seen it. Well, we don't. They'll do that. Okay. Well, vote to attached. terminate, and I made that motion. It says I think execute. it was seconded. It. it was attached. It's, it's in the agenda packet. It's in the agenda letter. packet. Okay. All right. We have a motion to execute the termination letter from Commissioner Whitmore, second by Commissioner Cruz. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Madam Clerk, it's approved unanimously. Jerry, thank you it's for. Um, we'll get it. For you. I missed that altogether. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. So we'll make sure that's clear so. in the future. Thank you so much. Oh no, thank you. Oh, I do have it. Here it is. Yeah, we we saw it. Yeah. All right. So moving on down, then we're going to go into advi uh, advertise public hearings, building and development services, um, number item number forty three. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners. I'm Sandy Tudor with the Building and Development Services, uh, Floodplain Section Manager. I'm here today to explain to you the changes in the ordinance that we are required to make in order to, to maintain our Class 5 certification in CRS. The lower the number in CRS is, is better. They are requiring to go from a Class 9 to a Class 8 that you regulate all residential buildings to base flood elevation on the map plus a one-foot freeboard, and that includes mobile homes. Currently in our ordinance, we allow mobile homes that cannot meet stand the standard, the elevation with standard setup to do 36-inch reinforced piers. So we have to eliminate that 36-inch reinforced piers, otherwise we will be reverted back to a class nine, and that has a potential of two point, almost $2.4 million lost in discounts for citizens in the CRS program. All right. I have a chart if you'd like to see it. I'll we'll pass it down. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Madam Chair, while we're passing, can I ask my question on sure. that? Okay. Go ahead. What I wrote my notes was, first of all, there's no action. This is the first of two public hearings. We currently have a class five, uh, class five rating, and that results in a 25% discount on all properties in Manatee County. I mean, in our jurisdiction, sorry, not all, not in the cities. Um, and flood insurance premiums. Right, and in high risk areas, it's 10% in zone X. Correct. Uh, mobile homes eliminating 36 inch piles, or if we don't, we go down from a to a 5% discount versus a 25% discount, or 10 in some areas. And like you just heard, it's $2.4 million uh, that our taxpayers will be paying. In additional oh, And this additional is mandated by fees. state, right? Hmm? This is mandated by FEMA or state? No, this is this is a, a CRS is a program that is is run by insurance services offices for FEMA. FEMA, okay. This is for FEMA. Thank you. And like I said, if we uh, like I said, there's a potential of two almost two point four million dollars lost in discounts to our citizens for insurance premium flood insurance premiums if we have to revert back to a class nine. They are mandating that. To go to a even a class eight, we have to enforce free board on everything. And I support this. Um, I know where I live, Anna Maria lost their flood insurance rating. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if other cities have done that, but uh, it's you know, it, it's for our savings for our taxpayers, and it's to minimize the flooding. <laughs> That's the whole purpose of it. 
It's to the benefit of our citizens if we make this change in the ordinance and regulate every residential structure to the one foot free board. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I don't have any other, oh, I do now, Commissioner Satcher. Sorry about that. So, it did something, is this a new regulation that's come down? Yes, it just it became effective January 1st, 2021. Okay, so before, this wasn't an issue, but then they let us know that Correct. this was going we, to be an we've issue. We've been allowed to do the 36 entry and force pier since 1986. Okay. So this, and we've been doing residential buildings with the one foot free board since 87. But if we do not do it on manufactured homes now, we're going to lose the discount. So, and then you, we were contacted by FEMA about that or by the insurance uh, organization? FEMA, it, FEMA sent letters, ISO sent letters, the state of Florida floodplain management office sent letters on this. We've been notified of it. The reason it wasn't put in the ordinance when I came up here last year in 2020 is because it wasn't effective yet and they were still working out the language. So there's other counties in the this same is, boat. This is state, this is nationwide. This is a nationwide program. Thank you. All right, not seeing any other um Commissioners on the board, I'm going to open this to public comment. Anyone from the public like to come forward on this item? Seth? No? No. Okay. Well, I'm going to close public comment. Then this is the first hearing. Uh, the second one is scheduled for April 20th of 2021. All right. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Sandy. And Sandy, thank you for being here today. All right. Let's see. Moving right along. Um, 44. 44? Mm -hmm. All right, number 44. Um, Hello, Jan. Oh, that was quick. I just saw you at the EOC. <laughs> Been back there all day. <laughs> Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman, Commissioners, <laughs> County Administrator, County Attorney. <coughs> Jan Brewer, Director of Financial Management. The item before you today includes a TEFRA hearing and then a motion that we're requesting from you. And if I can explain a quick executive summary of it. FPL issued debt back in the 80s for a generating plant located here in Manatee County. They refinanced that back in 1993. And when they did that, they did it with the Miami-Dade Industrial Authority. Now they're seeking to refinance again. TEFRA is required because in, in order to maintain the integrity with the IRS code, it is the Tax Equity of Fiscal Responsibility Act. So the requirement of TEFRA is that the highest authority with it, that where the finance property is located, they seek approval from that board and they hold a public hearing there. You are the highest authority within this area, within our county boundaries. Um, this does not obligate Manatee County in any way whatsoever. This is purely an administrative function that is necessary due to the, to the tax act. Um, and with that, all we're asking is, we've ha is we're holding the public hearing now, and then we request the adoption of Resolution R21049, which approves the request that is coming from um, FPL for the Miami-Dade Industrial Authority. And I'm here to answer any questions if you have any. Thank else. you, Jen. I have no commissioners on the board, so I will open this for public comment. Is there anyone from the public? that would like to speak on this item. Item number 44 on the agenda. I'll just make the motion. Not seeing one. anyone, Seth, no? Okay. Uh, I'm gonna close public comment. What's the pleasure of the board? Move Commissioner Cruz. Cruz. Yeah, I, I move to adopt resolution R21049, which approves the request in connection with the issuance of bonds by the Mi Miami-Dade County Industrial Development Authority as requested by Florida Power and Light for projects which were within Manatee County. Second. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Cruz, a second by Commissioner Whitmore. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, Madam Clerk, it's a unanimous approval. All right, thank you very much. Now we're going to go to our 130 times certain. <laughs> Stay here all day for that. It's 131. <laughs> we're Short good. and sweet. All right, item number six, presentation of results from the spring 2021 interns. Yes, sir. 
Hi, good afternoon, Madam Chair, County Commissioners, Mr. County Administrator, and Mr. County Attorney. It is my pleasure to have these guys go through their final presentations. We do have a PowerPoint. Um, just for records, this is something we do twice a year for the spring and summer. They and come and present their final results to I'm you. I'm sorry, they, did you state your name? Xavier Cologne, Thank Senior you. <laughs> Neighbor I mean, I know who you specialist. are. But yeah, sorry for the okay. record. Um, yes, yes. So um, just a brief overview, since I know you guys have a lot going on. We started the program in 2017. The major issue that we wanted to tackle was, as you saw this morning, we have people retiring. Um, right now, I believe our numbers are still near the 30% mark that are eligible for retirement at this time of our workforce. So one of the ways we wanted to solve that was by bringing in new talent. Um, this is our third spring cohort. And thus far, the internship program has successfully completed 62 projects, saving in the hundreds of thousands in staff time alone. So I will start off by the mentor will come up, one of the mentors of the team. They'll come up, introduce the rest of the team, and then the intern will come and speak. They had a guideline of five-minute presentations, five to seven slides. So it should be short and sweet, and they'll take any questions after their presentation. Thank you. All right, project one. And I'm sorry, that's <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Hector Rojas, and I'm with Information Technology Services. I'm co-mentor with Al Cox, and we're here to um, part of the client services team. My manager is Cindy Schneider, and our department director is Susie McGuire. Our spring intern is going to be presenting on the uh, CARES Act deployment project. Um, this. These last 11 weeks have been very quick, quick, and so he's been an integral part and also a, a productive part of our team. So I'd like to introduce you to Carl Juzma. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Carl Juzma. First, I would like to say thank you to Mr. Xavier and Mr. Rojas for presenting me and introducing me to the board. As it states, I will be presenting my findings and current results for our CARES Act deployment project. First off, I would like to start off with the reason why we're doing the project to begin with. Uh, COVID-19 hit us really hard. We weren't prepared exactly for remote uh, working with our employees within the county. We had a temporary solution, which was providing everyone with loaner laptops in which they would connect back to their main computers here in the office but that would prove to be inefficient and may have drawbacks if the main computer in the office went to, if it ever goes down. So what is the CARES Act project? I mean, the system. The system includes, we give each user a laptop with a backpack, two monitors, a wireless keyboard and mouse, a power strip, as well as a docking station, which all the components connect together. So when you're in the office, you just plug in the laptop, it becomes your desktop, when you're ready to go, unplug the laptop and go. So the effects that we wish to achieve with this CARES Act system is that first, we are providing our employees with the latest technologies with a mobile development. Second, we'll be able to allow our employees to quickly and effectively work remotely in the cases of right now with COVID-19, but later on in the future with events like hurricanes or any damage that may appear to the office environment that they're working. As well, which I'll touch later on, we will be reducing the number of Windows 7 operating systems that we have around the county. I'll explain the importance of that later on. So our current results at the moment, we have 206 systems out and deployed in the wild. We have 14 that are ready to go. And we have 306 that we need to go through, image, get a person assigned to it, and deploy it to them. I conducted a survey because I would like to see how effective our system is to the people who received them. Currently, I received 20 out of the 76 people I've sent a survey to. 20 of them were, were impressed by the speed and efficiency that we delivered the system and set it up for them. 18 of them supported that portability was the main improvement factor that they had noticed. And 16 said that it was a major improvement 
over their old system that they were using, both the desktop and the loaner laptop they had before. An additional side effect of the CARES Act system, since we have to replace the old system that we're replacing with the users, is that we're also removing some Windows 7 systems from our county. As we may know or may not know, Windows 7 is currently at the end of its life cycle. And if you wish to get more security updates, which security is a big concern, uh, you would have to pay a fee to Microsoft for an ESU or extended security updates. Currently, with our current projection, the ESUs will spend us about $18,500. And also, by the end of the year of 2023, Microsoft will no longer support ESUs. So the more efficiently that we can remove Windows 7 systems, the better. Any Windows 10 systems that we run across that we were replacing is going to be stored to be redeployed later on. And any Windows 7 will be wiped later after a week, so we just make sure that everyone's files is there. So if anyone's missing anything, we can give it back. And after a week, it gets wiped and surplused. So what I would like to achieve from this project, the future outlook after this project is complete, I would like to see a development of both desktops and laptops in our inventory. So if somebody needs to work remotely and they currently have a desktop, we can just quickly grab a laptop from our supplies and swap it out for them. But that doesn't mean that we're just gonna go laptops only, we're gonna have desktops just in case. And also, another outlook is that we will be reducing the costs of spending for continuing Windows 7 end of life support. Any questions? Interesting. Sounds um, pretty good. I do not see any commissioners on the board. Very, very good presentation. Thank you. Good Thank job. you, miss. Thank you. Look for a job with us someday. <laughs> <laughs> I have one of these, and I love it. It's a Is really it? good system. The, the laptop, the whole system he's talking about. It's excellent. Huh. Actually, I have one, too. <laughs> <laughs> Good All time. right, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, thank you for your time and thank you for having me. All right, next up is, whoop, hopefully I didn't go over one of their slides, sorry guys, in advance, is Project Two. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Wendy Edwards. I am a GIS analyst too with property management uh, under the Energy and Sustainability Division. My manager is Eric Kaplan and my director is Charlie Bishop. Um, real quick, I wanna give a shout out since our um, presentation is about drones to all of the county drone pilots who have been busting butt out at Piney Point. Piney Point. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, hey. just want to out for that. <laughs> Um, and especially under Charlie Bishop, who's done a lot to help progress this, and the Board of County Commissioners for supporting our program. Um, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our amazing in uh, intern, Sharu Abraham. Also, before I get started, love to give a shout out to my other mentor, Hamar Paches, who's helped me greatly during this journey. Welcome, everyone. It's a great honor to be here with you all. Again, my name is Sharu Abraham. I am a second year at the University of South Florida. And as a data analytics intern, I have been developing a cost-benefit analysis calculator for property management's use of drones. Yeah. To date, the county has used approximately $53,000 on drones. Now, not to fret, that 53,000 has accumulated over the past few years, with 25,000 being given by the Board of County Commissioners, 15,000 used for associated costs in implementing the program itself, and 13,000 in facilitating drone flights again over the course of a couple years. Currently, there is an existing as well as an expired enterprise agreement with two drone services companies. While those enterprise agreements had little to no startup costs, Comparing those private rates to the rates of performing operations in-house here in Manatee, we see savings from 40 upwards of 60%. Okay. Wow. Across the county, we see public safety and beach patrol using drones for search and rescue practices, 
documentation of public areas, as well as recording coastal topography changes. We also see public works using drones for asset management, construction progress, and damage assessment post storms. Shifting our focus to property management, the program started in 2018 with 36 pilots undergoing professional training. Currently, the county has 10 drones and property management has three. Since then, interest in drones, as well as the potential of expanding uses, has only grown. Today, property management uses drones for thermal imagery, mm. asset capture, aerial photography, 3D modeling, and much more. Here I have displayed the cost-benefit analysis calculator I developed for property management. In the top left, users may input the hours they spent during their missions. They then can select their mission type from the drop-down feature. Excel will go ahead and calculate the total cost of that mission while also displaying the breakdown. Conveniently, that cost will then be displayed next to the cost if this particular mission was done by one of those drone service companies. When I was developing this tool, I had to have a really good understanding of the shared components with all missions that can be done through Manti County. This includes the planning stage, which is further divided into site evaluation, uh, flight requests, etc. The flight itself, which has its own set of safety precautions, and lastly, post-operation tasks, which include processing as well as report writing. I also had to have a thorough understanding of the rates and terms outlined in those enterprise agreements. Looking into the benefits of owning drones, the clear pros we can see are the thousands of dollars we save in reviewing county property using county equipment. These savings are only furthered when those operations are handled by county personnel who then can also take part in those post-mission tasks. Looking into the intangibles, we can safely conclude that drones are extremely time efficient. For example, drones can accumulate topographic data up to five times faster than conventional methods. Not to mention, these conventional methods can now be done in a safer manner. Looking further into intangibles, we can focus on prevented damage, which is achieved through in-depth evaluation using advanced thermal sensors. Here I have displayed the actual cost of three repa roof repairs within Manti County. The column to the right includes the projected cost if these repairs were left unattended. On three properties alone, drone use has saved the county nearly $15,000. And considering how much property the county owns, this savings area alone can be astronomical. Shifting to drone use on a broader aspect. Here I have displayed drone use within the county on a 15-year projection with the assumption that drone activity increases about 30% every five years. The top two trend line represent operations if carried out by those drone service companies. Much lower, you'll find two more trend lines which represent in-house operational costs done by Manti County. I want to bring your attention to that orange third trend line. This again represents in-house operational costs, but includes a $40,000 reinvestment every five years, which may be allocated towards replacement and maintenance costs on existing equipment, as well as newer technology. This visual shows you just how cost effective having county owned equipment and using county personnel is. It also shows you just how adaptable the current existing drone program is. Over the last few years, we've noticed that in using county equipment, as well as county personnel, we've saved upwards from $34,000 to $75,000. In continuing current practices, in the near future, we can expect upward savings of 60 to 70% savings. In conclusion, <laughs> in conclusion uh, it's been evident that drones save money, and it's clear that they'll bound to, they're bound to continue doing so. Thank you all for your time and consideration. Good job. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Great program. Thank you. Go Bulls. Go Bulls. Go Bulls. Go Bulls. Go Bulls. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Vanessa Zigich, and I'm with the Bradenton Area Convention and Visitors Bureau, and I am one of Luisa's mentors. Um, Becca Prossen is also a mentor, but she couldn't make it today. And Anna Pohl, our um, general manager of our facilities, is also um, in our team, and she couldn't make it as well. They're both actually out at Premier Sports Campus. 
So Luis is here to um, give his presentation, and we have loved having him, and we're excited to implement um, his project in the future. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Luis. I'm originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, it's a glad to be here working for uh, the Manatee government. All right, so I was uh, sure to, to, have a, a, to create a short-term and a long-term strategic plan to optimize the use of uh, Premier Sports Campus, Brent Center Convention Center, and, uh, and the power across the state. And the importance of this project was to create, to increase the destination awareness and to generate revenue. So before you get into details about the, the strategic plan, I'd like to talk about the, the venue. So first we have the Brent Center Convention Center, which hosts multiple types of events, such as graduations, tournaments, gun shows, etc. And then we have the Power Cross Estate, which uh, hosts around uh, 150 events per year, and it has uh, mainly weddings and uh, corporate events. And then we have the Premier Sports Campus, which has, is mainly a sports facility that hosts around uh, an average of 90 events per year. So to get into the details about the plan, so we have the first one, the one-year plan. And for number one, I like to build a relationship locally and regionally. Uh, as you guys know, COVID hit us and a lot of business stopped working with us. Uh, so we'll try to have, to re remake them come back to us. And so first of all, we have the order of priority. So focusing on Brenton area and then Florida and then the uh, United States in general. So have, we have the feeder markets and as, I, like I said before, the COVID hit, a lot of people are scared because of the, uh, their health and safety. So I thought it was important to, to partner up with some hospitals, like medical centers in general, to show them that we do care about their health and safety, but uh, our health and safety from our, from our staff. Um, and second one, I'd like to bring awareness to destination brand and venues. And that will be the use of social media, e-commerce, and face-to-face -face meetings, et cetera. That's when I created the, this little R for you guys uh, to see. Uh, this R represents what I think is a little bit missing on the Power Cross Estate. People got, that go there for weddings, they do not know about the history of it. So we, as you can see on the left, we have the Power Cross is standing right there. And then on the right, it's what's used right now for weddings, etc. And you can see a person holding on Instagram and just a fun fact to see on, on your Instagram every day. And then we have the five-year plan, which uh, for number one, I'd like to increase the access for the, co uh, the convention center, and that is the new Palmetto Sheraton Hotel. And the construction plans will be defined within the next 60 to 90 days. And uh, as you can see in this graph, you can see, uh, for example, the estimated economic impacts of visitors. Right now, we have uh, around six, six million uh, earnings. And in the future, with the hotel, we're going to have a triple of that, and that will be 18 millions around, around that uh, the margin. And that's a very good implementation implementation for us. And another one that I want to include in the five-year plan is the, it's to sell the package deal. So you guys are asking, what's the package deal? So basically, if a company comes and they want to have like a, an event in the convention center, we can tell them, oh, we can have another all the other events of you have on the Premier Sports Campus or in Paul Claus Estate. And that's the package deal. And at the end, for so everything has a result. And for the one year, I like to focus more on the bringing of awareness. And the five year, I like to focus on revenue. And the end result for that is the revenue cycle. As you guys know, when it comes to when people come to uh, our area, people are going to spend on hospitalities, and that will be the bad taxes where we can have those bad taxes spent on our venues, make them more beautiful, and then advertise them to the to everyone, so everyone can come back. And uh, that's the revenue cycle. And some personal results from the, this internship was public speaking. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm from Brazil. My original language is Portuguese. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for my accent. But uh, it's good for to be presenting to you guys today. Um, and another way is the, the finding new ways to implement creativity. As you guys saw, my Photoshop skills. Uh, now it's, I can do that on for the government. So it's, it's a pleasure to do that. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Luis. Good job. Thank you. We need to introduce you to Carlos. Excellent. <clears throat> Hi. 
Hello, my name is Michaela Lindykamp. I am a neighborhood services specialist with the Neighborhood Services Department. And I had the honor of mentoring Audrey and we were supervised by Simone Peterson. And she's gonna tell you about her grants database project that she's created that will greatly benefit our neighborhoods in Manatee County. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Nice to meet you. My name is Audrey Bennett. I am a sophomore at New York University. I am studying applied data analytics and visualization, and I am also the grants database designer for a neighborhood services department. So to begin, um, my project was to design a database of public grants that will be featured on the Manti County website. And the issue that my project is addressing is that Manti County government has a limited capacity for grants for neighborhoods, meaning that while we have a grant program, it's a little bit difficult to supply every single neighborhood with the funds that they need for their projects. So therefore, that's when we tap into third party grants to supply those neighborhoods with the funding. However, the other issue we're addressing is that there's no tool to centralize these grants and also residents lack the awareness that these grants are available for them to use. So therefore, this database is a great tool for them to use and create funding for neighborhoods. My results for this, uh, for this project is that I have comprised $14 million in grants for neighborhoods to take advantage of. I have also done extensive user testing with the help of the entire neighborhood services department. As you can see in the categories of ease of use, appearance, and the overall rating of the database, the database performed extremely well, which I'm very happy to see. Um, we are currently also working with three neighborhoods in the moment to um, use the database, apply for a grant, and hopefully receive that grant. We are working with Rabonia, Talavast, and Osprey Landing in the, at the moment to use this database and hopefully receive a grant. The process in which I came to these results is I used Excel to store the data, and then I used Power BI, which is a data visualization tool to create the interface of the database. It is featured on the Manti County website, which uh, you'll have the uh, barcode in front of you. At any time, if you would like to scan it with your iPhone, it'll actually bring up the website that it's featured on, and you click the link to say view database, and you view the entire database. That interface was actually created using Power BI. All of the grants focus on community revitalization, such as improving things like parks, neighborhoods, roads, etc. And it is all geared towards the applicants, such as residents, local government, such as Manti County government or Sarasota County government, HOAs, or other community re representatives, or just individuals of Manti County as well. The impact that my database is going to bring is an increase in projects. When neighborhood and so when neighborhoods realize that these grants are available, that will drive the increase in progress, an increase in projects to um, better the community, and will also bring funding awareness, which means that many neighborhoods will realize that this is available and be able to find ways to help their community, resulting in an increase in community pride and a sense of home, and also resulting in a increase in lifestyle, safety, and value. And for a look into the future with this database, hopefully there will be grant opportunities for each department. So while this database is home to neighborhood services, an idea that we have created is that uh, parks and natural resources could duplicate it as well, and their grants can be focused around things that they need for their department. So neighborhood connections will also increase, meaning that neighborhoods will get to know one another and see that their projects have developed, and hopefully that'll jog an idea for another neighborhood as well when they create that connection. Sponsorship is also another idea, meaning that if the same individual or company gives out the same grant to the same neighborhood year after year, hopefully that relationship will stick and create a sponsorship into the future, uh, funding for more projects and um, other activities or ideas which all of this will result in community acknowledgement, meaning that overall in Manti County and hopefully Sarasota County, will understand that these grants are available for use and will help neighborhoods to take that first step to revitalize their neighborhood. All of these will be powered by the great use of analytics, meaning that we will focus on neighborhood statistics and the financial aspects of neighborhoods to see what they need. So if we know a certain neighborhood is 
needs funding for a park or needs funding in another area, such as a garden, we can tailor those grants to focus on supplementing those projects. We can also monitor database traffic, meaning that we can see what grants are performing well and what grants um, are the top those for those who are applying for them. This internship has been a great pleasure and I've learned so much. So thank you so much for listening. Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, we do have a couple of commissioners on the board. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I represent West Bradenton and, okay. and the island. Um, and it seems that in my, in my area, my district, there are many neighborhoods that were developed prior to HOAs. Mm -hmm. So some of those neighborhoods actually have voluntary HOAs as well. Mm -hmm. um, how do you reach out to neighborhoods that don't have an actual organization? Um, and, and, you know, because those are usually the neighborhoods mm -hmm. that, are, aren't, that are disorganized that, that need mm -hmm. the most help. Um, so, so that was a, that was a big thing that I noticed with a lot of neighborhoods was that some of them are don't have an HOA. So sometimes what a lot of these grants fall under a category called unrestricted, meaning that any individual you or I could apply for them. Or sometimes they can fall under another category, meaning that you just have to represent your neighborhood. So if you have an individual saying, like for example, I live in Riverwind, so I could say, hey, I represent Riverwind. I would apply for these grants, and you can see where you qualify. So not everything has to be an HOA, which is the beauty of it. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can apply for a beautification project for your uh, divided roadway improvement. Cortez? Yeah. You Personally, be, you can apply. You'll, you'll be getting an invitation for a meeting to that <laughs> soon from <laughs> Celeste. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, I was kind of playing with the that. Scan. Okay. <laughs> I was kind of playing with the database on your your code. How are you getting this QR code out? Is it strictly living on our website right now? Or are you going directly through the HOAs themselves? What's our method of disbursement? This is brand new. So the method of reaching out um, honestly starts back at Neighborhood Services Department. So I've been working with Michaela, um, who's my mentor, to get the, get the database out. We've mentioned posting it on Nextdoor. Um, not everything has to be accessed through the QR code. You can simply search at Manatee County Neighborhood Grants, and it'll also pop up, which is the nice part. So simply just by a Google search, the, the database itself will pop up. But there are definitely different ways, like through social media or through just word of mouth and working with other neighborhoods to get the database out there. But Nextdoor, I believe, is a really big tool that we can use. All right. One, one thing I would, uh, and I'm sure you already thought about it because it seems like you put a lot of effort into this. Um, a lot of the HOAs, not in Kevin's district, but in, in districts that have real HOAs are all managed by, like, just a very small handful of management companies. They don't do it themselves, the Argus's, CNS's, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You may want to talk to them because they constantly send out notices for, for annual fees or because somebody's palm tree is falling down, whatever they want, they just pester people. Uh, you may want to talk to them about just slapping this QR code on their notifications because mm -hmm. that gets it out in front of everyone. And at the very least, you'll get it out once a year when they send out the annual fees. Thank you. We'll do that. And yeah, I thought the QR code was a great way to like, you know, rather than a link. But yeah, I definitely will definitely take note of that. Thank you. Commissioner Whitmore. Yeah. Um, that's a good idea about the QR code. Uh, and you know, there hasn't really been a central area for grants. I mean, uh, neighborhood service, you've got so many grants and you've got so much going on. But also, uh, I wrote Parks and Natural Resources, like you said. I mean, mm -hmm. they manage tons of grants, WCIND, Gulf Coast Consortium, Swift Mud, when they're matching grants for parks and preserves. And, and I know when people leave, it's kind of lost. It's in a file cabinet or on somebody's computer. So this made me think when you were talking, and it's great. I, I think we should look at something like this countywide, because look at transit, how many gazillions of dollars of grants they have every year. And um, you know, public works. All, I mean, there there are so much mm -hmm. that we could. This, if if we could grow this, this would be great. But it, um, it had to start somewhere. Yep. And um, you know, everybody's so IT oriented and computer oriented now that if there was a central place in various departments that somebody mm -hmm. could just pick up the ball and roll with it, if somebody leaves or et cetera, or what what's available. So thank mm -hmm. you very much because when you're, you're, you're talking, I'm thinking of all these departments that throughout the years that. You know, people leave and it's, it falls behind or whatever. They don't know what grants we have or what status they're in. So I appreciate it. Good Thank job. You. Thank you. All right. I don't see any other commissioners on the board. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Thank you so much.
Good afternoon, Commissioners. <clears throat> My name is Kyle Rogers. I work in the Human Resources Department under Training and Development as the Training and Development Specialist under uh, Kim Stroud as our Director and my manager, Christine Fritz. And I have had the pleasure to work with Brian Long over the last 11 weeks, and he's going to talk to you about our new Manatee Momentum for our onboarding program. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Long. I'm the human resources intern for this cohort, and I'm here to present to you an onboarding program we've designed called Manatee Momentum. Good. Welcome. Now, this program is structured to increase communication between new hires and their departments, resulting in a structural framework for first-year employee development. Now, that sounds like a lot of jargon, so let's get into that a little bit. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> when I was introduced to this program, I was told of the turnover problem facing our county. I learned that in 2020 alone, 56 new hires, which is to say people with one year or less with the county, quit of their own volition. Now, data from the World at Work organization and the Society for Human Resource Management suggests that roughly $15,000 is spent per employee lost in turnover. And even if we only multiply that by the 56 who quit, we still wind up with almost a million dollar problem facing our county. Mm. Now, where do we even begin when addressing something so large? And my best practice says, try and assess some problem areas. And thankfully, that's exactly what Human Resources does. In a series of surveys conducted over 2020, participants noted problems with these top three areas of their first year development. For career growth, participants mentioned wanting to know more about how to network, how to gain promotions and certifications for their job skills. With financial benefits, participants noted issues with learning about FRS, VOIA, or how to properly apply their health insurance. And an overwhelming majority of participants noted problems with either the quality or the duration of their on-the-job training. Now, the main issue linking these things together is information. People aren't getting the information they need to get their job started off right which is why the main structural feature of our program is the first month checklist. The first month checklist is a document that charts important information for an employee's first month on the job. Now, this may include information such as equipment locations, standard job protocol, and job skills, but the specific information on the list will be tailored to the departments to which human resources will be reaching out during the implementation phase of this program, which begins this summer with the new HR intern. Now, to facilitate this program, there will be an employee selected from within the participating departments that we like to call the spark plug. Mm -hmm. And much like a spark plug in an engine ignites fuel to generate power, a spark plug employee is a goal-oriented, hard-working employee who is ready and willing to motivate and guide their new coworkers. And how that's generally going to look is when a new hire is introduced to their department, they will be introduced to the checklist and to a spark plug employee selected from within that department to guide them. From there, that spark plug will be hosting a series of weekly meetings in order to go over each and every item on the list. And once a new hire feels sufficiently knowledgeable about the information, they can sign off at the bottom to mark completion with that portion of the project. And in order to maintain momentum through an employee's first year, the spark plug will also be hosting a series of quarterly meetings to reassess information on the list and prepare the new hire for other aspects of Manatee County government employment, such as the employee performance evaluations. Now, the only thing left to address is how we know any of this is actually going to impact turnover. And in short, we know because of how the program works and what it targets. For instance, the main structural feature, feature is organized in such a way as to standardize the first year experience for employees so that both new hires and supervisors alike know what employees need to know and how to get them there. Likewise, the customizability of this project is such that any aspect of it can be altered, changed, or manipulated in such a way that it does not affect the structural integrity of the project so as to better meet the needs of the departments participating. And 
Upon successfully doling out this information to new hires, we can expect them to develop a more solid connection to the work they're doing, considering that they will be further educated as to the impact of their labor. And research in the field of humanistic psychology suggests that um, work done with that intrinsic motivation is done consistently well. In review, one, upon successful implementation of this project, we can expect to see a reduction in cost by that 15,000, an improvement in job attitudes across the surveys that human resources will be conducting, and, at the very least, before anything's even implemented, we've developed a firm base of research upon which to launch and develop new programs going forward. Any questions? Yes. Joe. Commissioner Whitmore. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> You're great. I love the spark plug, and I love the implementation <laughs> form. And just for somebody like me, I, you know, I've always had a job, and I've never really ever asked about benefits because I just got to have a job, and I know they're there. And, like, some of the programs that you talked about, I've never ever inquired about because I don't know what they mean, and I didn't know really whether I needed them or not or anything about FRS until, you know, somebody – a couple of years ago, even told I mean, I knew I was in a retirement, but I didn't know. But it's just because we all get in our little silos and we work. And um, these are benefits that you just don't get everywhere. And um, having that checklist to have your spark plug go over it with each new hire is really important. We have uh, programs where you can act. I just started at the tax deferred on your medications. All that. How long have I been here? I didn't know how to do that. I mean, there's so many things that. We, programs that we offer, we have leadership training, if we want to um, groom any of our employees up so they can go higher up, that we all get, we're all so busy, especially look at this last year with COVID and everything, that I think this is wonderful. And um, it's just all about the department finding that spark plug in their department to get them motivated to keep our employees because time is money, employees are money if we lose them. So uh, very refreshing, very good. I met you in the elevator, and you were telling me kind of what your program was, and I went, oh, I guess I'll just talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, very good job. You did good. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Well, I, I've got a question. Yes, how can and I And I loved your presentation, by the way. I mean, you certainly know how to keep people, keep our attention. Mm -hmm. right? Thank you. It was great. But I've got to know, where did you come up with the word spark plug? So that's actually a carryover from our very own um, Hal Williams from Hal Will Guide. He, uh, he brought up the concept of a spark plug during a meeting, and I had hashed it over with my supervisors who, well, it started out actually as a placeholder name because we didn't know whether we were going to stick with guide, like buddy, partner, mentor. Yeah. And thankfully, Hal came along and introduced that concept to us. So I talked it over with Christine and with Kyle, and we settled on using <coughs> spark plug. I would keep that word. I think it's great. Oh, Thank good you. to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Commissioner. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't have any other commissioners on the board, but seriously, thank you. Come thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully, you'll come. I'm looking forward to hearing more about spark plugs. Um, thank you guys so much for listening to these presentations today. Just to go over, the goal of this program is to attract, train, and hopefully retain new talent for Manatee County. Going over the numbers, even with the new cohort of five, we are looking at about a 30% hiring rate overall. But then we even get into it, we know that if you're a junior, sophomore, or freshman in college, you're most likely not looking for a job yet. So when we look at college seniors, graduate students, we're looking at about a 40% hiring rate, which is pretty high for a program in which we don't promise them a job at the end of it. Mm -hmm. So once again, thank you guys so much for your support. And we hopefully will be presenting the summer interns, introducing them in June, and then presenting their final presentations in August to you. All right. Thank you. Good thank job, you. Xavier. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, guys. Thank you. give them just a minute to exit. I'm looking down at the, um, at the agenda. I believe 47. the next, next item oh. is number 47, uh, Commissioner Satcher. Thank you. Get my screen on.
Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to bring before everyone um, a program that they actually already utilize in Sarasota County. Uh, Commissioner Ziegler mentioned it to me. Um, and he said that it just runs absolutely great there. So the idea basically is similar to when we have the invocation and uh, pastors or you know uh, ministers in the community can sign up and be here on that day and give the, the prayer. Well, this you do the same thing, but with veterans. So veterans can sign up to come and do the pledge. And, uh, and so we borrowed some of their paperwork, um, and I think we made our own version of it. I, I believe, or it may still be Sarasota's uh, version, but we'll, we'll make it ours. Um, but so that even, you know, he said that they'll even have uh, World War II veterans come and, uh, and their whole family will come sometimes and, uh, and they'll do the pledge and give them a certificate afterwards. And uh, it just seems like a worthwhile program. Um, and you, I know that uh, so many people up here, uh, we love our veterans and appreciate what they do for us and for our country. Yep. So it seemed like a very simple thing that we could do to make a difference. I think that's great. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I completely support yeah. Commissioner Satcher's idea. Uh, in fact, my Aunt Edie, her father is 99 years old, and he is a oh. Pearl Harbor survivor. He uh, so he would be my oh, first baby. recommendation to bring in Aww. to lead a pledge. Oh, uh, so, I'll, of course, I'll, I'll let him make his motion, but I would love an opportunity to second it. You sure can. All right, well, um, can I just ask Mr. Commissioner Satcher, I see Lee in the back there. Lee, did you want to come forward and say anything, sir, real quick? He's actually a pastor as well, so he could I do know. dual duty at 99 years old, my <laughs> uncle. You don't good to see you. Mr. Washington here. You as well, Madam Chair. Uh, Lee Washington, Manatee County's Veteran Service Officer. Um, when we got the email from Karen Stewart um, to investigate this, what Sarasota County was doing, I reached out to Manatee County's Veteran Council, and they did not object to this program, and nor does my office. So with the approval of the board and the guidance from the county admin, uh, my office would definitely step up and, and help you folks uh, put together a program with this. And uh, seeing that we're starting to have conversations about veterans and veterans' homelessness, this is a great kickoff to that. So I definitely support that. Yeah. Go for it. Thank you. Commissioner Bellamy. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> Case no veteran shows, you can do it. <laughs> this, this, this is great. You know, and when I, when I saw this um, coming through, I um, remained very quiet um, because I wanted to make sure when it got here, um, I showed my level of support and, and excitement for this um, as, as a veteran. And um, on behalf of all the veterans, I can't speak for them, but in any time we have the opportunity to be acknowledged and, and, and be appreciated for the service and the things that have taken place in order for where veterans have actually fought for this country, it's commendable. So I, th I thank you for the stride, Commissioner um, Satcher. Um, this, this, this is just one step. Um, again, the communication that we have about you know, homeless veterans and, and things that we need to do to make sure that we sh extend that consistent appreciation to the individuals that have defended our country and continue to defend our country. So again, thank you. Commissioner Servia, did you want to say anything? Oh, just that I fully support this idea and thank you, Commissioner Satcher, for bringing it forward. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the wheels on my head start to turn uh, as Commissioner Bellamy was speaking. Uh -oh. um, well, no, it's, 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 you know, depending what's on the agenda that day, you know, yeah. what might help us choose, like, for instance, Coach Eddie Shannon is a World War II veteran. Indeed. Yeah, he and I, during a rain delay, had a long conversation about his experience. But uh, anyway, so, so the day that his park, you know, his park, but the park that will be named mm -hmm. after him ultimately comes up, he would be a perfect candidate to... Mm -hmm. to do the, the pledge exactly. that day. So, anyway, exactly. great idea, Commissioner Thanks, Satcher. Thanks, Kevin. Make right. a motion. Um, motion. Commissioner Satcher, would you like? So, I move that uh, we direct staff to uh, form and bring back for our, do we need another vote after this? No. 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 This okay. is it. So, I vote that we form a veteran-led Pledge of Allegiance program for Manatee County. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Satcher, a second by Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, and before we vote, I'm going to have to open it up to public comment. Uh, is there anyone in the room that would like to speak besides Lee? 
Seth, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry for the delay. It is 605605. Please press star six. Anna Tor Griffin, Manatee County. Um, I just think this is a great idea, and I applaud whoever brought this forward. Thank you so much, and uh, God bless all of you. Thank you. Anyone else, Seth? That's all, Madam Chair. All right, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Uh, we have a motion to approve. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, aye. nay. It is approved unanimously, uh, Madam Clerk. Yay, good job. This is awesome. Uh, we'll go down now to um, Commissioner Comments. We'll start down here. Commissioner Bellamy. Yes, I, I would ask to, um, the, the board to support me on something. We have a, um, a, a speedy traffic issue um, in Palmetto um, in the areas of 5th Avenue East and 27th Street North and South. And um, I'm asking um, to put temporary speed tables um, so they c it can be evaluated within the next 120 days. And um, when this came up, um, they told me I need to talk to you. Trying to write down the locations. Right. And, and it, it's something that was kind of ongoing before you, you, you arrived, sir. Um, and I've been talking about this uh, for three or four times with, with Clark and um, – in, in, in chat. So um, the bottom line is I've heard from some individuals within the community and um, a couple Sundays ago I got a, three or four messages about it and I went and I counted about 16 children in the road, right? But there's a lot of speeding motorcycles which you can't do anything about but um, well, we need to be able to do something about it. Speeding motorcycles and cars, cars on, on Fifth Avenue. So they basically told me that I needed to bring it before the board and um, make a motion so we can put the speed tables down. For, for Right, right. And I'm okay with that, so I'm bringing it before the board. <laughs> and I just asked, and, and the, the, here's, the, here's the, the intent, um, because the neighbors have asked for this, is to put the, st the speed tables down to assess the situation um, and see what can possibly be next. Um, so I'm bringing it before the board and asking, asking support on it. Uh, you know, I had always heard that we had to, they had to sign a petition right. and get 67% right. of the residents in that area to, to sign the petition before they do it. Well, you, you, and, and, and I think the issue that, I, that would bring my concern that, you know, that road alone is, you know, probably more, not necessarily a lot of homeowners, you know, as far as renters. Okay. And, and that makes the petition sign a little bit. So, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, suggestion. First of all, is it is it in the county or is it in the city of Palmetto? Who it's in the county. Okay. It's in the county. Um, I would suggest there there is a process that we go through. Uh, I think we we understand mm -hmm. the the desired outcome. If you would give us the opportunity to bring that process forward, and then you can make the motion. Well, let me just tell you where I what I've, I've talked to the, the transportation. I've talked to the sheriff. I've talked to to everybody about it because what I don't want is for a, a, a kid to, to get hit and then like I told them the other day it's like what well, we we don't want to be reactive we want to be proactive okay. and so, um, when I spoke um, to them about it it's like well you have to bring it up you need to make a motion they're prepared to um, to put the speed tables down but they just wanted to make sure that it goes through the board and um, and, and it's approved so, so perhaps the motion could be to to direct staff uh, to 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 implement the process uh, to Put result in uh, the 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 speed tables to us. Uh, uh, I understand what your end result is. So, well, I think it's two phases um, okay. from what the discussion was. Assessment. Yeah, yeah, the, the assessment, and that's within the, the speed tables for the, the 120 days, um, so it can be evaluated, and then. The next step was, you know, how, how can we look at it? When communicating uh, with, with the sheriff department, you know, he, he basically told me, hey, listen, they, they can put the speed tables, they can do whatever they need to do, um, but it's not a, a sheriff department issue, right? But I, I, regardless of who we, what needs to be said and how it needs to be said, I just want it to be done. Okay, so perhaps Start Mr. Procedures. Clay can help. Yeah, I agree with, with you, Mr. Cat. Uh, we need to start the procedure. Right. Yeah, because I know there is a... a policy that's in there. Commissioner Whitmore? There's a major policy in there, and yeah. it's reason yeah. because of neighborhoods, um, safety, and budget. 
uh, 9th Avenue Northwest, is that where that went? Those speed tables? Oh my God. And we actually had meetings, public meetings of it. And I don't know about Kevin, but I got tons of complaints because some of those tables are pretty high and some are lower. And I'm not saying that there's an issue, but I don't think we can just go and say, I want one that at this table. There has to be a process. Yeah. And if it's identified as a public safety budget and the neighbors want it because nobody wants it in front of their house. Yeah. That's another problem you had on 9th was, well, we're okay with it, but move it down the street. And so we end up putting two, and finally they calmed down because we did other things too. But I understand what you're saying, Commissioner, but I think you, we just can't vote. It's, I don't think it's fair to staff. We have to justify that we need it. And we have identified that there's a potential need, and that's the beginning of the process. And we could direct staff to look into it and come up with a recommendation of what they think we'd best need. If it's a four-way stop in the middle of the street or, you know, I don't know. Just so, you're, you're looking for traffic calming. But you sure don't oh, want no anybody doubt. speeding over and crashing, you know. I mean, I saw it on 9th. I was shocked. Um, I, I just think there is a process that we all have to follow. That's how I feel. Sorry. Well, I just want to be noted that the request is there. And uh, right. if, if we is. can, whatever the process is, expedite it because it needs to be addressed I mean, for safety purposes. You and, can and make Commissioner that Millie, I, I hear you loud and clear. And you, we've had this discussion about right. the, the neighborhoods and, right. and school age children. So, so we will... We will take this seriously, and we will, uh, before the next meeting, uh, be prepared to bring it back to you. Thank you. That's yeah. pretty good. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge? What was the, what were the, what was the address, the, yes. the road again in between? Fifth the, Avenue East, between 27th and 29th. Between 27th and 29th. Okay. Um, my, my predecessor had speed tables put in on 9th and on Ruby Boulevard, and... Where campaign since I've been elected, I constantly hear about <laughs> apparently the the thirty three percent that didn't want it. And the Riverview <laughs> Boulevard too. Yeah, right, Riverview Boulevard as well. Terrible. Um, so be careful. I, <laughs> I, I didn't even put the damn things in, and I hear about it. You know, and, and the only way this would come up is because the community that is, I've, I've had in residents that that live on that area they've asked. You need to do something. So if this is part of the process for us identifying sure. what we need to do. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to make sure it's clear that this board is addressing the public safety concerns that the residents has brought to me. I'm sure residents were all over making noise to him as well. But I'm starting to rethink maybe sure. stop signs are a better way to go. But at any rate, just throw Don't even up. go there either. Okay. We've been through that <laughs> but too. I, but I always, I always try to support whatever the district commissioner right. wants, thinks is best for their district. And so maybe it'll you. happen. We just got to do the process. Mm -hmm. Anything else, um, Commissioner Bellamy? No, ma'am, I'm done, ma'am. That's it? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Satcher? Uh, thank you, ma'am. I just wanted to give an update on the uh, Bradenton Hope Fest um, that was Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of last week. And I've got my notes here. We had, they had uh, Renan DeBarros and his wife, Maria, uh, really spearheaded things. And I could not even start to uh, go through the others because so many people volunteered and uh, went out during the day and uh, just really uh, just a great event at Pride Park. Uh, more than 200 kids every night with lots of fun, uh, fun activities. More than 15 different ministries and churches came together. 570 people committed their lives to Jesus as Lord. Wow. How many? 570. That's getting it done. Uh, free groceries to every family who attended. Uh, paid more than $1,200 of people's utility bills. Gave away more than $10,000 in prizes and giveaways. This was, it was nice prizes. I saw some of the pictures on Facebook. And uh, hundreds of Bibles were given away by the Gideons. And now they're working on connecting these people to the community of believers to help in their time of need. So just an awesome uh, success for the community there at Bradenton Hope Fest. Wanted to mention that. Thank you. Commissioner Whitmore. Yeah, I only have one thing, and um, um, I was directed at one of the meetings to bring it back in a future agenda. So I would like to make a motion to direct staff and the county attorney to draft and schedule in a future public hearing the banning of retail sale of dogs and cats. That would be my motion. said we would bring this up at a future meeting. We have to direct staff to come up with an ordinance. Then we'll have a public hearing, and we'll have to go through this process. So that's my motion. I'll second that. Thank you, Mr. Satcher. We have a motion by Commissioner Whitmore, second by Commissioner, um, I just went blank, Satcher. Satcher. Before we vote on that, we'll have to open it up to public comment. Anyone from the public want to come forward and speak on this subject? Seth? Okay. 
I'll close public comment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All opposed? Aye. Okay, um, Ms. D, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, honey. Yes, I voted in favor. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, it's unanimous. Thank you. What's the vote? Six, 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 six to one. one. Madam Chair, it was six to one. It was not unanimous. Okay. You said aye. Didn't no, say he that. said no, he I know. You said, said all opposed, and I said I. Oh, I am so sorry. So, so sorry. Six to Madam zero. Clark, no, six, six to one with uh, one. Van Austin Bridge. Yes. Thank you, everybody. I apologize. I thought you said I. I'm going. That was a very good day for me just now, so I'm not saying anything else. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Probably why. Doing this, I won't talk anymore. <laughs> yeah. Commissioner Van Austin Bridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so. Our staff and state officials are doing a fantastic job at Piney Point right now. Um, and Congressman Buchanan and Senator Scott have both are both on appropriations committees and have both um, acknowledged verbally to us that they will stay, and as Senator Boyd as well, that they are going to stay the course with Manatee County beyond um, the initial crisis. You know, right, the initial crisis and, and stay with us through the cleanup and the environmental and economic impact that is, is likely to follow. We don't know for certain, um, but the grave concern in my district out at the beaches and the island um, and in the estuaries is the potential for algae blooms and for red tide to follow mm -hmm. this. Uh, it's, it's likely that um, we will be receiving substantial funding for our recovery, our cleanup, the rebuilding of our estuary, seagrass beds, you know, whether it be seeding, snook and redfish, whatever it might be. Um, so I just want to plant the seed now that I think that we should start preparing ourselves uh, for how we want to spend that money now. And we need to start inviting in Tampa Bay Estuary Program and Sarasota Bay Estuary Programs, both of whose boards I sit on. Um, I'm recommending the idea to the administrator and deputy administrator of Environmental and Economic Recovery Committee. Um, I feel that my district and probably Commissioner Satcher's district should be disproportionately represented on that committee because of the impact uh, that our districts will feel. Um, and anyway, it's, it's something that I would like them to start working on, uh, you know, once the crisis is over, basically. But I would like for us to be prepared when the money does come down uh, with the committee that, it, you know, what I would like the committee to do ultimately is have, you know, recommend and, and influence, be a recommending body to this board as to how that money should be spent. Um, and I, you know, obviously a broad, every from the business community to the environmental community, broad representation. And of course, I would like to serve on that committee. Um, so I wanted to present that idea to the administrator and to the board. So thank right. you. Just I trying to be proactive. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Whitmore, did you want to speak? To yeah. That? Uh, again, it's this this wall here. Um, the monies. Where was the monies coming from? The, the from wherever they come from. No, we will like shake from every the CARES tree. Act you're talking about, or the feds, no, I, I'm or are you talking to, about to this incident? That, I'm referring to money that we're hoping that, you know, for instance, Senator Boyd has, um, for the, pushing, has, has proposed a bill, filed a bill in, with the state to that the state will help us in our recovery, our environmental recovery. Um, so for this incident? For this incident. Oh, oh okay. So we're, okay. Hoping that, we're hoping it's going to start raining money right. when it comes to reco recovery. Well, uh, okay, I have a question um, on this. Can you consider, there? We, we're, we're a member of three estuaries. So we need to make sure somebody from one of each of them is represented. Because sure. we're the only county that actually is has three estuaries surrounding it. Right. And also there's that nitrogen consortium. That's really important. Tampa Bay. Yeah, Tampa. That needs to be included too. Yeah. And I think, is that all guys? Uh, well, this is just impromptu. I'm bringing this up yeah, now. But these but are people. Hopefully the, the yeah, county well, administrator and deputy administrator will, during our Charlie, briefings, and sit yeah. down with us individually to get feedback okay. uh, on who well, we those think. Are the, should two. be included. Those so. are the two I thought, because yeah. those are, they're very, um, and you, you sit on some of the boards, so you know they're very involved with the I've CRS. I've got my and share of emails, too. I don't too. know if all the new ones know, but at the port, maybe maybe you were told, but we did a seagrass um, mitigation years ago, but there's there's a 1,000 acres of, of seagrass um, to the north on the port that we planted years ago to mitigate for something else. I think it was man or whatever. But it's a thousand. We had to because of the dredging. Right, the dredging, but then also a man is right there too. So yeah. yeah, it's real important. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good idea. Yeah, and I'm thinking not just from the environmental standpoint, but also the Anne Marie Island Chamber. You know, Longboat should have a say. Um, you know, I've spoken to Ed Childs about it already. So oh, he's freaking out. create a large and course so consortium. <laughs> economic and environmental. Thank you. <laughs> Is that all? Commissioner? Yes, Commissioner Cruz? Uh, I'm good. 
Solution to pollution is dilution. <laughs> That's what Mr. Child said. <laughs> I loved it. Um, I'll wait and go last. Um, Mr. County Attorney, anything no, to add? No, ma'am. <laughs> All right, well, I'm running out here. Ms. Servia. Servia, does she have anything, sir? Seth? Yes, um, just one thing to share with everyone. Um, this week I met with the Talavast Focus Group. Um, they have been around for, I don't know, a long time, more than 20 years. Um, and it was nice to talk with them again. Um, I will be reaching out to staff on a, a couple of different items that they're looking for support on, which uh, really is just their long-term goal of implementing how Talavast will continue to grow and protection of the historic neighborhood. Um, and so I've sent out one email, though there will be more coming and then as, as appropriate, we'll discuss with the board. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. County Administrator, do you have anything, sir? Uh, I do, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, thank e each of you for the confidence you've shown in me uh, the past few days and the support. I'll do my best to continue to uh, honor it. And I'd like to commend you as a group. Uh, we, I believe we've come together today. Uh, I ask that we have a different climate, uh, and we've conducted the business of the board. Uh, we've had very healthy, productive dialogue, and I, I really appreciate it. And I'm confident that the community uh, does as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Madam All right, Chair. I'll go last. Um, there's a couple of things. I um, I know you want to talk last, so I just had a question. I just want to know if we could get a follow-up. I know personnel met with Tarnisha. Um, she's the president of the Black Chamber and personnel, I think. Oh, it's scheduled tomorrow. Okay, good. I was just wondering if um, okay. individually if we can get uh, briefings on it. Okay. Karen knows about it. She'll tell you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to say, uh, Dr. Hopes, you've done a fabulous job. I mean, you stepped right in the lion's den, and you never missed a beat. Uh, I will tell you that uh, you, you probably didn't know this, but the commissioners that have been there, um, particularly during the, the news, you know, the press conferences, we've all been amazed, and we all just look at each other in awe. Uh, so you've done a fabulous job, uh, better than I think anyone could have possibly done. So don't, don't make his head too big. I know. Well, you know, it kind of reminds me of you, but anyway. It's a low bar. Yeah. Um, a second it's door it's been office. okay. It's only your first week. It's been okay. <laughs> uh, pretty damn good first week, I have to tell you. Um, there is a meeting that has been scheduled. I just want to to uh, tell the board. Um, there is a meeting that has been scheduled in Tallahassee tomorrow afternoon at five o'clock. It is with the Pandemics and Public Emergencies Committee. And it's about Piney Point. Cool. Um, so uh, um, even though um, Representative Robinson is not on this committee, he has been invited as well as Dr. Hopes and myself. Um, and I understand that we've both, um, there's a card there in case they want to ask us questions. So we're not sure, at least I'm not sure at this point, uh, when and how I'm going to go. I'm supposed to get my second vaccine in the morning. Um, I'm supposed to get it at 11. I'm hoping to get it at 9. And Dr. Hopes, I think you were too, are you yeah, not? Yeah, I am too. I'm going to suggest that we get it the day after. I was going to say you're going to get uh, sick. Because we're both getting our second yeah. doses, and I think, we'll, I think we'll we'll be better if off we can do that, day. that'd be great. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I just didn't we'll know. We'll take care of it. I'm, I'm sure our... Okay. So you're flying or... Ryan? I think we're probably going to be driving. Madam, Madam Chair, is it, if that's being streamed or televised in any way, is it possible that we could get that I, on? You know, I, I think, think it is, Florida actually. Channel. County site. Um, Florida Channel. I think it'll be on the Florida Channel. Yeah. Um, I, I will tell you that I did hear from uh, Representative Robinson just a little while ago, and he said that they are actually uh, negotiating their budget tomorrow during the day, so we're not even sure that it will be at 5 o'clock. It depends on how long it takes them, so we'll have to see, but... At any rate, that's really all that I have right now, other than to say again, uh, you know, just how proud I have been of this board uh, with the reaction to Piney Point, and I thank all of you. And staff goes without, that goes without saying. I mean, staff has been staff fabulous, been. fabulous. So at any rate, that's about it. So with uh, nothing further and not seeing any commissioners on the board, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>